Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining the CCF Thursday educational webinar. My name is Emma Mock, and I'm a patient advocate with the Cholangiocarcinoma Foundation. Today, we are joined by Dr. Bullock and Dr. Sarwar. Andrea Bullock is an assistant professor in medicine at Harvard Medical School and director of gastrointestinal medical oncology group at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center in Boston, Massachusetts. Amar Sarwar is an associate professor in radiology at Harvard Medical School, an interventional radiologist and director of, multi, of the multidisciplinary liver tumor clinic at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center in Boston, Massachusetts. Um, if I can just remind you to please avoid asking highly personalized health related questions and try to keep them more general. Um, and if for any reason we don't get to your question during this webinar, I'll make sure to follow up with you over an email to get it answered. So I will turn it over to you both. Thank you, Emma. Um, it's such a pleasure and honor to be here with you all today. Um, please uh, give me a hand wave if, uh, if people can't hear okay. Um, but we are, uh, Dr. Sarwar and I are really pleased to be with you today, and we're going to speak about um, some research efforts that we have underway um, in hoping to in improve and expand on treatment options for patients facing intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma by combining chemoimmunotherapy with uh, transarterial internal radiotherapy, or what's often known as uh, Y90 or yttrium-90 radioembolization. So um, just to go over our agenda for today, we're going to briefly um, summarize some of the standards of care in systemic therapy for advanced biliary tract cancers, and then uh, go into more detail about the evolving role of immunotherapy. We wanted to highlight what we see as a, a really in, important efforts in the multidisciplinary care of patients with, with all types of liver cancers and then um, introduce you to some of the liver-directed therapies that, that we use in treating this disease, and then highlight uh, this phase two study that we have underway at our institution, again, in which patients with locally advanced, unresectable, or metastatic intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma are treated with combination chemoimmunotherapy and radioembolization. So I suspect that this crowd is, is probably quite familiar with the systemic treatment options available for biliary tract cancers, but it is, it is always good to provide that review. Um, I often talk to my patients about the three different families or arms of systemic therapies that we use in treating cancers, including cytotoxic chemotherapies, immune therapies, and targeted therapies. And uh, cholangiocarcinoma is really quite unique among the gastrointestinal tract malignancies in that all of these types of therapies have demonstrated benefit and are approved for use in treatment of this disease. Chemotherapy has been the mainstay of treatment for, for many years, and gemcitabine cisplatin, that combination has been the standard of care for more than a decade since the ABCO2 trial uh, showed uh, that this combination with beneficial over single agent gemcitabine in, in helping patients uh, with, with uh, biliary tract cancers. More recently, there was a suggestion that perhaps we may see benefit from a triplet combination, adding NABPAC Lataxol to gemcitabine and cisplatin. This regimen held promise in a phase two study, but quite recently, actually, um, the results of the, the phase three SWOG study were um, released, and, and that actually showed that the triplet combination did not um, result in a survival benefit over the, the doublet combination. There may still be a role for this triplet, particularly in patients with locally advanced disease or those which um, uh, we're looking for a yielding a, a response. Um, but when we use all three drugs at the same time, we do find we're using more of our tools quickly. Uh, in subsequent lines of therapy, we consider combinations with fluorouracil, both fluorouracil oxaliplatin and fluorouracil with nanoliposomal irinotecan. More recently, and, and last year, um, the results of the TOPAS-1 trial led to a, a major change in the standard of care for cholangiocarcinoma, 
in that uh, established the combination of gemcitabine cisplatin and the PD-1 inhibitor dervalumab in the first line treatment. So this combination uses chemotherapy and immune therapy and yielded improvements in survival response, disease control uh, for patients with uh, this disease. In subsequent lines, we also consider um, combinations of pembrolizumab, another PD-1 inhibitor, with a tyrosine kinase uh, targeted therapy drug called lenvatinib. There's also some data to suggest benefit from the PD-1 inhibitor drug nivolumab, either alone or in combination with the CTLA-4 inhibitor uh, ipilimumab. In this talk, we're not really going to focus as much on the um, targeted therapies, but of course, there's been uh, a great deal of research in this area and um, improvements in treatment. And I know at our institution, we, we certainly advocate for all patients to have their tumors tested, um, to undergo molecular genomic profiling, next generation sequencing testing, to look for actionable mutations, as there are drugs that um, can help patients whose tumors harbor things like FGFR2 mutations, IDH1 or 2, uh, excuse me, FGFR2 fusions, IDH1-2 mutations, uh, BRAF mutations, HER2 amplification, or um, BRCA mutations. And I do want to make sure I give credit to um, a really uh, um, talented research fellow, Dr. Santiago Sucre, who's been working with me over the last uh, year for helping to provide this uh, summary slide. Going into a bit more detail on the immune therapy, since that's more of our focus today, just wanted to show the results from the Topaz-1 trial, which again um, led us to know that adding dervalumab to standard of care gemcitabine and cisplatin improved treatment options. This combination yielded uh, median overall survival of 13 months and improvements in progression-free survival as well. Um, but really importantly, we're seeing that this benefit persists, and that's what we see with, um, with, with immune therapies, that, that this response, the patients whose cancers respond, it can really last quite a long time, and that's why we're seeing even improved divisions in those curves. Um, of course, in cancer care, well, we are pleased when, when we have new treatment options that help patients do better, but we are always looking and striving to see, can we do better even, even more so? Um, so we're trying to improve on how to make um, of immune therapies more effective. And so this recent study, the IMPRAVE 151, looked to see, well, can we improve on the tumor microenvironment by adding a drug called bevacizumab um, to the atezolizumab gemcitabine cisplatin backbone? Atezolizumab is a PDL1 inhibitor, so it's a drug, a cousin drug of dervalumab. Um, so this study. Uh, randomized patients to the chemoimmunotherapy with or without this bevacizumab drug, which um, the thought was that the bevacizumab would enhance uh, access of immune cells to the, the cancer cells and improve efficacy. But in fact, it actually did not reach its primary endpoint and it, it did not yield a significant benefit. Um, our work is looking to capitalize on something called the abscopal effect. So the abscopal effect is a, a hypothesis in the treatment of advanced cancers, whereby it had been noted um, many years ago that, uh, that if you provide a local therapy to a tumor site, you may see response or tumor shrinkage at a distant site of disease or at a metastasis. So for example, if you radiate one tumor, you may see response or shrinkage in a different tumor. And it was later determined that this is probably due to an immune system effect because the radiation is priming the immune cells against tumor, uh, we call tumor antigens or enhancing liberation of these tumor antigens to increase the immune response. So in our study, we hypothesized that adding radiotherapy to combination chemotherapy and immune therapy will promote an enhanced immune response in cholangiocarcinoma and lead to a more robust and durable or long-lasting treatment response. In our study, patients are treated with chemotherapy plus dervalumab for one cycle, and then they will be treated with yttrium-90 radioembolization 
to further prime the immune system, um, and then followed by additional cycles of chemoimmunotherapy. And this is a schema of our study, um, just outlining the schedule of, of events. And with any research that we do, we, we're looking to see how uh, safe and effective this treatment will be, but also doing correlative work that we hope will help us learn from this study, learn about which patients are benefiting the most, and hopefully apply what we learn uh, um, to the next round of treatments that we begin to study. Um, in this study, we'll be collecting tumor samples and blood samples, circulating DNA samples, um, and also assessing patients' quality of life while they undergo the treatment. Our primary objectives are safety and efficacy. We're looking at progression-free survival and the treatment-related adverse events that patients may face. We're also looking at the overall survival, the response rate, that's the percentage of people whose tumors uh, shrink down with therapy, and the disease control rate. As I said before, we will also be doing quality of life assessments. We're using a, a standard validated questionnaire to measure that and looking at whole exome sequencing on the tumor, circulating DNA. We're also looking at known biomarkers that um, have been shown to be predictive in other disease states predicting response to immune therapies like PDL1 expression and tumor mutation burden. And we plan to um, use the biopsy samples to develop tumor organoids, which is a, um, a way to further study uh, um, cancer samples, personalized cancer samples um, in a shorter time period in the lab. Um, so patients enrolled in this study, of course, have to have a, a confirmed diagnosis of intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma. And because they're undergoing this yttrium-90 radioembolization. They have to have at least one um, lesion within the liver present that, that can be treated with the uh, radiation therapy that Dr. Sarwar is going to discuss later. Um, we have to have measurable disease. Um, we want patients who are uh, fit and well enough to, to undertake a, a research study. Research studies can, of course, be quite demanding of people. Um, because of the requirements of the radioembolization, they have to have a certain body weight. Um, and we always want to make sure that people have adequate blood counts and kidney and liver function to make sure that it is safe to proceed. Um, if they have surgically resectable disease at enrollment, this is not an appropriate study for them. The study is looking uh, more for patients who have unresectable or metastatic disease. Also, if um, they have a different type of cancer in the liver than uh, adenocarcinoma or cholangiocarcinoma that, that we are not including in this study. If patients had had a prior surgery and resection, um, but unfortunately their cancer had recurred, if it had been more than six months since their um, recurrence, their initial treatment, then they, they are eligible for this uh, study. Um, if they've been treated previously with a checkpoint inhibitor drug like dervalumab, we are not including them in this study. And once again, um, we, we do want to make sure that patients are always in a fit, um, safe place to participate in a trial. So anyone who's had a recent um, heart disease or stroke, they're, they're, they're not eligible to participate. Um, we are focusing specifically on cholangiocarcinoma. So we're not including people who have uh, been treated for other diseases within the recent years. Um, if they have severe lung disease, that can be a contraindication to the radioembolization, as uh, Dr. Sarwar will discuss. Um, and if they have any active infection, um, that's also a contraindication um, primarily to the, the chemotherapy. Um, so actually, now I am going to um, turn this over to Dr. Sarwar, who will go into a bit more detail about what's involved um, with the radioembolization component and liver-directed therapy in cholangiocarcinoma. Thank you, Andrea. Um, and I'd like to thank the hosts and everybody who joined uh, to hear our discussion uh, about this important topic. 
So I'm gonna talk a little bit about radio embolization. Andrea, could you go to the next slide, please? So I'll start with a case. So uh, just to show kind of how the therapy works for those of you who uh, have not heard of this therapy. So this is a 71 year old man with a history of alcohol use and metabolic syndrome, but did not have any cirrhosis. Uh, he presented with a five, approximately five centimeter tumor in the right lobe. Um, and the biopsy showed a poorly differentiated adenocarcinoma consistent with biliary origin, which is medical speak for cholangiocarcinoma. Um, next slide. So the plan was to perform uh, radioembolization uh, with adjuvant chemotherapy uh, to ensure negative margins and reduce the chances of recurrence, um, and then continue uh, the chemotherapy uh, until the patient got to resection. Uh, so this was the plan that we created in our tumor board. Next slide. Um, could you play the first video, please? So here, what we've done is we basically went to, through the um, radial artery. So basically, we put a small uh, tube through the wrist, um, put another tube that took, uh, took it all the way to the liver, and injected dye to see the blood supply of the tumor. We can clearly see a very nice tumor blush up here on the right. Um, and uh, there's a blue arrow pointing towards the blood vessels that's supplying the tumor and a green arrow pointing towards another small vessel that's supplying the tumor. Could you show the um, uh, video on the right, the right hepatic artery cloning CT? So uh, what we're able to do these days, thanks to the technology, is that using a CT while the patient's on the table, we can actually directly see all of the blood vessels that infuse the tumor. Um, and by doing that, we can ensure that any radiation therapy that we give only goes to the tumor and doesn't go to any other part of the liver or other organs. Next slide. So once we've, uh, so this procedure is typically done in two stages. This first stage, we did the angiogram and we looked at the, uh, the map of the blood vessels that supply the tumor in the normal liver. And at that time, we inject a benign radiation, which doesn't cause any damage known as technetium into the tumor to kind of see the dynamics of where would radiation go when we infuse it. Um, and so in this case, we, we looked at the area, we saw that it was nicely localized over to the right side, as you can see on that image. Um, and we did the symmetry to determine what's the dose that we can give. And as you can see here, we chose, this is an earlier case, but we chose a dose of 180 gray uh, to deliver to the tumor. Next slide. And so here on this video, you can see that after we have injected, you can see this uh, microcatheter, which is about a millimeter and a half uh, in diameter, so really, really small, and it's sitting in that blood vessel that supplied the tumor. We've now injected millions of beads, which have um, a radioactivity labeled onto them so that they envelop the tumor and sit there and radiate the tumor over time. Um, once we've injected them, we remove the catheters from the wrist, we put a small Band-Aid on, um, and then the patient's taken to another scanner, which shows really nice localization of the radiation within the tumor. Um, this was the treatment procedure. Uh, both of these are outpatient procedures and the patient can go home the same day. Next slide. So after we had completed this, we, um, thanks to Andrea and her colleagues, uh, we continued four cycles of gencitidine and cisplatin, uh, which is chemotherapy. Uh, and then this patient underwent what's known as a central hepatectomy. So they only took out part of the central part of the liver without needing to remove the entire right lobe. Um, they had really good margins. And when they looked on pathology, when the pathologist kind of looked through the histology of the cancer to kind of find uh, if there was any viable tissue uh, available or not, most of the tumor had died thanks to the combination of very high dose localized radiation as well as chemotherapy. Next slide. And then this was the first MRI that we got about three months. And you can see that we, the surgeon only needed to take away a small uh, amount of uh, liver. You can see the defect uh, over uh, on that side. Uh, and there was no evidence of residual disease. Next slide. So this is um, nearly four and a half years after the resection. The patients had no recurrence of the cholangiocarcinoma, which I think most of us know is a very deadly and uh, kind of uh, very stubborn disease. Next slide. Um, but there was a small tumor that did show up at 54 months. Uh, this had imaging characteristics, not of uh, bile duct cancer or cholangiocarcinoma, but of liver cancer or hepatocellular carcinoma. And so we treated this with localized ablation by putting a needle into it and just burning it. Next slide. Next slide. Yep. And so nearly six years after the Y90, uh, this patient has had no recurrence of intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma, has a clean resection beds, 
um, and then also didn't have any recurrence of HCC. And the important point here is that by hitting it um, hard up front, by giving the radiation first, following it with chemotherapy, trying to get this initially unresectable tumor to like a, a, a resection, which didn't remove a lot of liver, um, we were able to get a long-term response that um, uh, without chemotherapy in the last three or four years. Next slide. So here I want to take a quick segue and talk a little bit about um, what we're doing at Beth Israel in terms of our multidisciplinary clinic, which has some unique aspects. Next slide. So I think the most unique aspect um, uh, in speaking with other of my other colleagues around the country is that we have one clinic day. So on one day, a Friday morning, essentially the patient comes to the liver tumor clinic um, and all the specialists from transplant surgery who do our liver sections, hepatology, who make sure the patient's liver function is working, medical oncology, without whom this clinic would really not run, um, interventional radiology, where we offer minimally invasive therapies, radiation oncology for patients where they may need external beam radiation and diagnostic radiology who helps us review the imaging. All patients come to one location. It's one visit to really get that plan. They don't have to go to other specialists or other clinics to uh, kind of uh, get other parts of their care. Um, another unique aspect is that we tend to meet as a group and come up with a single plan. So we all together will come up with one plan and then go tell the patient, this is the team's plan. And because we have all the specialists represented, therefore, if there's any novel combination that we can offer um, uh, to make sure that it's, uh, for example, chemotherapy and then radiation oncology and then transplant surgery, they're able to get all of that done in one go. And then in addition, we continue to follow these patients in the same multidisciplinary fashion. So even after they've been treated by surgery, the patient's going to come back to our, the same clinic and the same multidisciplinary approach will occur in the follow-up. Next slide. So thanks to this, since we started doing this in 2019, our overall volume uh, has been increasing. Uh, and I'm particularly proud to show the dark blue bars, which really show the number of patients who have been following in this clinic. And most new patients which is about 30% of our practice, we'll see two or more, more specialists during their visits, depending on what their needs are, whether they need, they need a liver doctor, a medical oncologist, an interventional radiologist, a surgeon, or a radiation oncologist. Next slide. We've also been increasing the number of patients that we have been treating uh, with our combination approaches uh, for cholangiocarcinoma and gallbladder cancer in particular going from almost 60 to 70 patients back in 2019 to nearly 100 patients uh, in 2021. And we're still crunching the numbers for 2022. Next slide. So our clinic is a four-hour clinic every Friday from 8 a.m. to 12 p.m. Uh, we do a tumor board that day so that uh, we make sure that everybody's on the same page and we come up with that single plan for the patient. All the specialists agree on it. Uh, it's on uh, the ninth floor of our cancer center. We typically get same-day imaging in labs if the patient's coming from far away, and it's staffed by hepatology, medical oncology, transplant surgery, radiation oncology, and interventional radiology. And more importantly, we also have a survivorship clinic for those patients who are in remission, um, and that volume is certainly growing, and that's staffed by our nurse practitioner, Cecily Kulsik, who's also the point person from the administrative side for this clinic. Next slide. So this is um, uh, the, the large group that uh, takes care of our patients, uh, many of whom have been friends and colleagues for nearly 15 years. Uh, and we have specialists from the Department of Surgery, the Department of Medicine, Radiology, and Radiation Oncology, all of whom are heavily involved in the care of our patients. Next slide. Oh, sorry. Uh, could you go back to the previous slide? One thing I should mention that I'm particularly proud of is uh, we heard a couple of weeks ago that they surveyed the patient experience in all the clinics at Beth Israel, including primary care, cardiology, hepatology, and our clinic uh, as a cancer clinic was in the top quartile of all the IDMC clinics in terms of the patient experience. Next slide. So switching back to radioembolization, um, uh, I think radioembolization has been around for a long period of time. It's a very effective therapy for cancers that are localized in the liver. Um, however, earlier on, and, and you'll see on these slides, some of the data that we had from 2010 up until 2020, quite frequently, um, radioembolization would be used later in the game. So if patients got systemic therapy or surgery and there was recurrence or there was tumors that were untreatable or patients didn't ran out of chemotherapeutic options, that's where radioembolization first started. And so when used in the um, second line or the third line setting, 
uh, we started to see that although the outcomes or the survival was quite good, uh, we were going beyond the 12 months that we typically see with systemic therapy alone. Uh, there were some cases uh, such as the two, um, um, the two publications that are highlighted in yellow where using Y90 later perhaps didn't have the best response. Next slide. And so more recently, the studies that are starting to come out, um, more centers, and these are centers both in the United States as well as Europe, uh, are starting to use radioembolization in a first-line setting because what they found is that if you use it in a selective fashion, meaning that you only target the tumor itself and you really spare the normal parenchyma uh, in a kind of a segmental treatment, uh, that the liver function uh, uh, doesn't get affected. And those patients get really nice tumor kill, but then continue, can continue their systemic uh, therapy as well, because we know this can very quickly become a systemic disease. And the outcomes of, in terms of survival for that is really good. Next slide. Another thing to notice that, over, that we've learned over time is that um, higher tumor dose is better. And I want to point out here that um, uh, expert centers in radioembolization are really um, uh, nuking these tumors with up to 280 grays of uh, biological effective dose, which is really quite high. And, and most importantly, we can deliver this in one session. We don't need to split this apart into multiple sessions. You can just hit the tumor hard, hit it once, um, and, and, and complete treatment in one or two outpatient procedures. Next slide. We've published our own results of this technique um, uh, back in 2021. Um, nearly 70% of our patients, and this just speaks to the, like where as a multi-specialty group, um, thanks to the close working environment that we have with our oncologists, we were really a little bit at the cutting edge of this. So not only were we treating nearly 70% of patients um, upfront, and these are patients who did not have resectable disease, but did not have disease outside the liver either. So had kind of borderline resectable or unresectable disease inside the liver, nearly 70% of them got Y90 first line. Um, and 35% of them had such a good response from the Y90, from the radioembolization, that we decided, well, maybe we don't need chemotherapy and let's just take them quickly to surgery and cut that cancer out. Um, we had started escalating our dose back in 2015 and up, and, uh, up until the time that this study got published, we were giving up to 200 grays. Since that time, we've started to increase the dose even more because we've shown that we were able to safely achieve this. And so thanks to this combination treatment with high dose radiation followed by chemotherapy, nearly 40% of our patients who at the beginning were, could not get a uh, resection, which we all know is a curative therapy, uh, subsequently underwent resection. 80% of them had clear margins at the type of resection. Um, only 40% of the patients who got surgery needed a big surgery, like an extended hepatectomy. Um, and then nearly 60% of our patients had more than 90% of the tumor dead when the tumor was cut out and they looked at it histologically. And I think it's because of this high dose Y90 in a very localized fashion combined with uh, chemotherapy and getting them to surgery that we were able to see an overall survival of nearly 25 months. So 50% of our patients uh, were alive um, at, at 25 months after diagnosis. Next slide. And so I'm really, um, I, I've heard so much about the Cholangiac Carcinoma Foundation. And once again, I'm so grateful to be able to speak uh, with members of the foundation and patients uh, who the foundation helps. Uh, I'm proud to report that our updated analysis of the results of our center of uh, uh, radioembolization and then systemic therapy and surgery uh, has been accepted for an abstract at the CCF. So I'm looking forward to seeing many of you at Salt Lake City and hopefully getting some skiing done as well. Uh, but uh, we saw that um, our, our numbers, like we had about 40 patients or so, we found that the first line Y90 cohort had a median survival of almost 22 months, but patients who were getting prior therapy and then going to Y90 when they ran out of uh, systemic options, uh, the survival was lower. Uh, I think because the number of patients is small, because cholangiocarcinoma was a rare cancer, this didn't reach statistical significance. But when we look at um, whether patients how long patients had before their disease started to progress, we see that the, the median progression-free survival was about nine months if we gave Y90 first and then did systemic therapy versus only three months if we did systemic therapy first and then did Y90. Next slide. And so with that, I'd like to show just another case of uh, a 69-year-old female who presented with an eight-centimeter left lobe cholangiocarcinoma 
It was extending into the central portion of the liver known as the caudate lobe. But more importantly, it was very close to this blood vessels that uh, known as the middle hepatic vein, which surgeons use as the margin from which uh, they're, they're going to cut. And because it was so close to the margin, uh, the surgeons were nervous that if they cut it, there might be some uh, disease within one centimeter of the resection margin, and that typically means that the cancer will come back more quickly. Next slide. And so we decided to do a um, uh, we decided to do a uh, com combination of um, uh, radioembolization followed by systemic therapy to try to shrink this tumor down and make the surgery easier. Here you can see that there were two blood vessels, the segment seven arteriogram and the left hepatic arteriogram, which were supplying the tumor. And you can see really nicely in that middle video, the tumor blush that shows up and it shows that, the, uh, that we can really concentrate where we deliver the beads to a very small part of the liver. So we gave a high dose of radiation. And if you could run that PET CT again, um, Andrew. Um, and then um, because we're one of the centers in the US that's doing a lot of post Y90 PET to see where the beads land, um, uh, we're able to kind of see that the concentration of the radiation or the amount of radiation that we give, is that sufficient or do we need to retreat early on? Next slide. And so here, within three months, we see that there's an interval decrease in the size of the mass. Uh, there's a small margin that's now appeared, you can see with the red arrow between the tumor and the middle hepatic vein. Next slide. And so we decided to do some systemic therapy. We completed three cycles and the patient underwent an extended left lobe resection uh, three months after the Y90 procedure. Nearly 80% of the tumor was dead uh, thanks to both the radiation therapy and the systemic therapy at the time of resection. Next slide. There were, uh, there were some um, issues afterwards. Um, so after surgery, she needed some biliary drains, which again, because um, patients are coming in, a, in our clinic to one location, uh, interventional radiology was involved in it. We continued some systemic therapy afterwards. Next slide. But as I mentioned before, cholangiocarcinoma, as most of us know, unfortunately, is a stubborn disease. And so there was recurrence in the small area of the liver pointed to by the right red arrows. Um, and this was biopsied and proven to be adenocarcinoma. So there was a little bit of a recurrence. Next slide. But thanks to the fact that we, again, had been using this radiation in a highly selective fashion, sparing most of the liver, this patient continued to be on systemic therapy, various cycles as she progressed through, and is st still on systemic therapy. Next slide. And is alive nearly um, uh, three years after the resection, after diagnosis, and is currently on immunotherapy and doing quite well. Her biliary drains have been removed. Next slide. And so I think um, we're really excited to be offering what we've been practicing clinically for a period of time. I think Beth Israel has had a lot of advantages in terms of offering combination therapy, which is one of the reasons we were successful in designing this trial and getting it funded. And we're really excited to offer this, not just to patients in Boston or Massachusetts, but around the country. Um, the advantages that we have that allow us to do this is really a close-knit team uh, that um, uh, really tries to understand the strengths and weaknesses of each specialty as we try to treat this cancer. Uh, there's a very patient-centered logistical approach to make sure that there are not too many visits downtown uh, for our patients. It's a single day, a single visit, a single plan that patients can have confidence. You know, every specialty had an equal say when the plan was being for formulated. Um, and then uh, in addition to kind of our experts in uh, medical oncology, uh, we have one of the highest volume uh, transplant uh, uh, centers in the liver transplant centers in uh, Massachusetts. Uh, which means that the liver surgery team is excellent and our radiation oncologists are fantastic. We're also pioneers in higher dose resin Y90 radioembolization. And these days we're treating with patients up to 400 grade delivered in a very selective fashion. Um, we've also been kind of making sure that we're carefully assessing the effect of that radioembolization by being one of the highest volume sites in the US that uses PET imaging after the Y90 to see where the dose gets deposited. And all of this has helped us um, uh, convert patients who were initially unresectable uh, into resectable patients and trying to cure a higher percentage of patients. And then we continue to follow them in a multidisciplinary follow-up. And so I think for all of these reasons, uh, we're very excited about this phase two study that we're um, uh, grateful to offer um, and hoping to see whether the results of the Topaz-1 trial can really be improved 
uh, by adding radioembolization into the mix and hitting uh, this cancer with a one-two punch of systemic therapy uh, and radioembolization. Thank you. I think there's two more slides. Maybe, I don't know, Ania, if you want to go to the last one. Yeah, thank, thank you all so much. And we're, we're really looking forward now to the discussion. I'll also just highlight our contact information um, for those who want to make a note of it. Emma, I am seeing a few questions coming through on the chat. Should um, do folks have access to those? Should we should we speak? Um, to them? Yeah, you can speak to them if you want me to read them to you. Whatever you prefer. Um, these I have up, but if more come in okay, while we're perfect. speaking, it might be no perfect. Uh, so um, the the first question asks: Is the clinical trial considered a success if one a resection can be achieved, or two if the Y ninety chemo combo uh, destroy the treated tumor. So the the trial that Dr. Sarwar spoke about that we had already published, that looked at combining Y90 with chemotherapy and was looking, and in that situation, patients all had localized disease and we were looking to see, could we increase the resection rate? The ongoing trial that I spoke about earlier is a different patient population. That includes patients who either have a localized unresectable tumor or also have uh, could have metastatic disease. And really the end point of the study, what we're looking to see is if we add the, the Y90 radiation to the chemoimmunotherapy, do we make the chemoimmunotherapy work better and keep the cancer under control for longer? Do we help to delay any time to cancer growing resistant to that therapy or progressing? Um, whenever we're treating a patient on a trial, we are always looking at what is best for that individual. If they have localized disease and we think that surgery may be helpful to them, that is something that we will consider, but it's not, um, so it is possible on the study, but it is not the end point or a, a success of the study. The next question I saw is, did I hear you correctly that if a patient is being treated with Dervalumab along with Gemcis, that, that, that they would not be eligible for Y90. Um, so that's, that is exactly what we are looking to, to evaluate in this trial. Um, currently, gemcitabine, cisplatin, and dervalumab is one standard of care therapy. There's a lot of data to suggest that Y90 may, as Dr. Sarwar said, may also be helpful for these patients. And, um, and we're looking to see if we combine these therapies, is that safe and is that helpful? Um, and is that more effective for, pa for patients? And um, Amar, please chime in at any time <laughs> as I keep going. You're, you're, you're doing the, great. <laughs> the third question is, does the Y90 of application for intrahepatic cholangiotumors outside the liver, e.g. lung or bone metastatic disease? Um, would you like to take that one? Yeah, sure. So I, I think the, 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 the short answer um, is uh, perhaps no. Uh, the longer answer is that in this particular trial uh, that we're opening up at Beth Israel, uh, we will be accepting those patients because um, what, what, what we are hoping to uh, see is that if you hit a cancer with radiation up front, it changes um, the environment locally around the tumor in a way that the immune system gets activated further. And then if you continue the systemic therapy, which is really the therapy that will go to these other sites that like the lung disease and the bone disease, the immune system has been primed to take better advantage of the immunotherapy. So while historically we have always said, or the general principles have been that if the cancer has gone outside the liver, then Y90 shouldn't be done in this particular trial, that's precisely the concept that we will be testing. I will also say that some tumor boards and some multi-specialty groups uh, will treat uh, cancer inside the liver with Y90, even if there's disease outside the liver. For example, if the disease inside the liver is growing, but the disease outside the liver is stable. So, so, on, in, so there's two answers here, which is what are we trying to do in the research and what do tumor boards typically do in terms of clinical care? Um, so, I, I mean, we typically think of radiation as a local therapy. It's only treating that one area within the liver, but science suggests that it may actually help 
disease outside of the liver. And that's what our research is trying to investigate. We don't know the answer to that yet. That's why we're, we're studying it. Uh, is success of the procedures impacted by FGFR2 fusions that have been previously treated with targeted therapy? Um, so when we look at these different biomarkers like FGFR2 infusions, um, we look at whether they are prognostic, whether that um, molecular finding affects a person's prognosis, and we look at whether it is predictive, whether it predicts response to, um, to some type of therapy. Of course, FGFR2 fusions predict response to FGFR2 targeted therapies, but to date, I don't think there's any data that suggests that whether a person's tumor harbors an FGFR2 effusion affects whether it is more or less likely to respond to, um, to radioembolization. Uh, do, do you agree, Dr. Sarwar? Yeah, I agree with that. Do you want to take this next one? Um, I forget, is the trial only for treatment naive patients or are we accepting patients um, who've had prior treatments? So the, the trial is for first-line therapy of patients who have newly diagnosed locally advanced or metastatic intrahepatic cleangiocarcinoma. So it is, is for the most part, for treatment-naive patients. If someone was originally diagnosed um, a year or more ago with a localized disease and they had surgery and then they had adjuvant chemotherapy, if some time had elapsed and then they unfortunately developed a recurrence, then they may still be eligible for the study. Um, but if they were initially diagnosed with an advanced or metastatic disease, then it, it then we're we're treating people in the first line setting. Um, there there are questions coming through on two different uh, <laughs> formats here. Uh, yes, so maybe I, I can answer one because I think one of the questions they're asking for um, this uh, to go back to the slide with the diagram of the radiation and the antigen. So maybe Andrea can do that while I answer a couple of these questions. So what would be the difference between focused external radiation, example, sorry, versus which slide were you looking for? Which slide? Um, the one with the diagram of radiation and the tumor antigen. I'm wondering if they're talking about the slide with the abscopal effect. Mm hmm. So, um, so what I would say, um, the difference between external radiation and Y90, this is a challenging question to answer because um, uh, there's been no head-to-head -head comparisons. Uh, the way that I think about it is that, um, you know, if, if we look historically at how external beam radiation has developed, um, it, has start, it started with a very large field. And then over time, scientists have tried to make the field smaller and smaller to avoid damage to adjacent structures. And they've certainly gotten very good at it with true beam or with cyber knife uh, as two examples. And there are others that are available as well. I think with radio embolization, the distinct advantage that we have um, is that because we're infusing the radioactivity into the blood vessel that supplies the tumor, and we can clearly see the blood vessels that supply the tumor. And when you have the blood vessels supplying the tumor, they're not supplying any other organ. They're not supplying the skin. They're not supplying the ribs. It's only supplying the tumor. And the beads are designed in a fashion that from where they land, um, they only radiate out about a centimeter. So it stays inside the liver as well. Um, and so because of these two reasons, um, we can give biological effective doses of as I mentioned, up to 400 gray in a single setting. Whereas I, I think that, and again, I'm not an expert in radiation oncology, so I, I apologize if I misspeak. Usually our colleagues um, in external beam radiation, when they want to give a really high dose to the tumor because radi like higher radiation kills more, um, they have to split it up into multiple visits to make sure that no damage happens to structures that are um, adjacent to the tumor or around the tumor. So that's how I kind of differentiate it. I think the number is higher, 300 gray, 400 gray. Um, and then secondly, the number of visits to come into the hospital or come into a center and get the radiation treatment, that's lower uh, with radioembolization compared to external beam therapy. But again, I think the best way to answer that question would be to compare it head to head, but that hasn't happened so far. Um, so somebody asked um, whether there were any particular sites of metastasis, such as lung or bone, that would disqualify a patient from this clinical trial. 
and there, there are not. Um, we're looking for patients who have disease within the liver and in other and and outside of the liver extrahepatic disease. There was also a question about has there been any research to those with the Klatskin variant? So we consider a, a Klatskin as um, an extrahepatic uh, cholangiocarcinoma. And certainly we use similar systemic treatment options, the gemcitabine, cisplatin, dervalumab, and the other list of systemic treatment options that I outlined, we, we would treat class skin care, uh, cancer similarly. And we know that there can be a role for radiation, but um, perhaps Amar could speak to why uh, radioembolization um, may not be the correct path for a class skin variant. Yeah, so I think uh, I think the important thing to note here is that the extrahepatic variant, uh, also known as the Klatskin tumor, um, is typically along the lining of the bile duct, and it doesn't usually form a mass. So another word for the intrahepatic variant is mass-forming cholangiocarcinoma, and it's when it forms a mass that it really starts to develop a robust blood supply that we can then target with radioembolization. I think with the Klatskin variant. Um, the size of the tumor usually is such that the blood vessels that supply it are extremely faint. Um, and with current technology, which is really small, it's only a millimeter, sometimes it can be very difficult to either identify those blood vessels or to place a catheter selectively into those blood vessels so you can infuse the radiation in there. So I think a CLAT skin in which, I, th I think the key question here rather than the CLAT skin is as long as there's a mass, because sometimes you can have a central cholangiocarcinoma, which is involving the bile ducts, but is associated with a mass, that would be treatable with radioembolization and uh, this clinical trial. But I think if there's no mass visible on, in the liver on imaging, those patients would not be treatable just because uh, uh, the blood supply for those tumors are difficult to see or difficult to access. So if there's a mass, if there's a mass associated, yes, we could consider it. Uh, again, we would have to review the imaging, discuss it in our tumor board, make sure it's a good candidate. But that certainly uh, would be something that is treatable. Oh, this is a great question. Someone asked, is there financial support offered for patients who travel from out of state? Um, we do have a, a very small travel stipend uh, with this study, but. Um, it, it really just covers kind of uh, gas mileage and, and parking, which unfortunately can be expensive in Boston. Um, so th there is a travel stipend, but it's, uh, it is limited. Um, this is a, a trial that we've developed uh, out of our own institution. So unfortunately, uh, funding is, is limited for that. So I can, I can answer uh, Diane's question. Um, What I would say is that um, as, I, as, as an example of the few cases that I showed, um, I think radioembolization when it's, when it's performed in a selective fashion um, does not really affect um, liver health. Um, and I think that's the key part that it needs to be delivered extremely selectively. And as long as we're able to do that, um, and, and I will say we're almost always able to do that in those cases, um, uh, the, the liver health uh, does not get affected. The other thing I would add is that um, we have certainly had patients who haven't had um, appropriate growth after portal vein embolization, but there are many studies that show that radioembolization, if you give it in a non-selective fashion only to half of the liver, um, it actually causes that lobe to shrink down and the contralateral side to grow up. So radioembolization and portal vein embolization can work very similarly. And I've certainly had patients in whom portal vein embolization didn't work. And then we treated the entire right side. So we intentionally um, did not, were not very selective in giving the radioembolization. We gave it non-selectively to intentionally damage uh, some normal liver. And that caused even more hypertrophy after the portal vein embolization hadn't get, get gotten us the success that we wanted. Um, I will say again that we're not perhaps using that approach as part of the clinical trial that we're discussing. This uh, question is a little bit outside the clinical trial context, but I would say that radioembolization can help patients who don't have adequate liver growth in the contralateral side to get them to surgery. 
Someone asked about um, displaying the, so the slide that summarized the, the uh, systemic treatment options. So I, I have put that up. Um, and someone else asked, would, would a, a person who is diagnosed within a year but previously treated with gemcitabine, cisplatin, and abraxane um, and a targeted therapy be eligible for this study? Um, that person would, would not fit the eligibility for, for this particular study. Um, you know, we do hope and anticipate there will be other studies combining chemoembolization and systemic therapy in the future. Um, unfortunately, for this study, we have to be uh, very strict with the eligibility criteria, and, and someone who has uh, previously received those therapies would, would not, uh, this wouldn't be an appropriate treatment option. And uh, it looks like, yes, the recordings will be available. I think we got all the questions. Yeah. Okay, well, um, would you mind sharing your contact information, the last slide, just really quickly, in case anybody has some questions come up? Wish I could, wish I could scroll through more quickly to make sure people oh. get busy with this. I'm sorry. <laughs> no worries. Um, thank you both for everything you do each day. Looking forward to seeing you at the annual conference. And thanks again. I hope you have a good day. Thank, Thank you all. Take Thank care, you. everybody. Bye.